The film opens with Margot, Anya Taylor Euphoria, and Tyler, Nicholas Holt, looking out for a harbor for a boat to take them to an island. Margot smokes a cigarette and Tyler tells her not to on the grounds that it will demolish her sense of taste. She takes note of the boats little and he says they just have 12 visitors, they create a gain by charging $1,250 a head, we meet a portion of different visitors, Lillian Sprout, Janet McTeer, is a food pundit who went wild about Hawthorne. The eatery there made a beeline for when it originally opened, she is joined by her significant other, Ted, Paul Adelstein. Tyler lets Margot know that eateries rise and fall in light of her audits. There are likewise three tech brothers who are rambunctious, all boasting about their mastery on multifaceted investments and digital money, they board the boat and the chief welcomes them, letting them know it's a 30-minute boat ride to Hawthorne. A celebrity, John Leguizamo, sheets the boat. Whining that his partner, Felicity, Amy Carrero, has booked something so intricate for supper. Everybody is given a little nibble to begin the excursion, alongside champagne. It's portrayed in a hoity-toity manner, example, silver-bright salmon caviar reaped today here in the sound. Presented with a smoked hood stream shellfish, clam leaf cream, and a pale lager air. Tyler rushes to snap a photo before Margot and him eat. He portrays it in a hoity-toity manner, you really want the lavishness of the cream and the mouthfeel of the roe. Margot is unenthused, the boat shows up on the island, and everybody deboards and is welcomed by servers and house staff on the deck. Each checks in however Elsa, Hong Chow, the eatery skipper, eyes Margot dubiously. She lets Tyler know that she's not who he had initially joined to go to with, and he said that he has parted ways with his sweetheart and is bringing Margot all things considered. This scares Elsa. Every one of the twelve visitors are relaxing at a scope behind the cafe. Two of them, and Judith Light, and her better half Richard, Reed Burney, are regulars, so they simply go directly to the eatery and keep away from the presentation. Elsa invites the others and lets them know they will be a piece of a remarkable story told with the menu, one that hasn't been told previously and won't ever be told from now onward. They get a visit through the island, being informed it is twelve sections of land of backwoods and furthermore approaches the ocean so the manly mollusks they'll eat this evening were reaped that day by a man in a dinghy. They're shown the smokehouse where they're informed the dairy cow meat is matured for 152 days. One of the tech brothers jokes, what occurs assuming that you serve it on the 153rd day? Does the situation become ridiculous? Elsa answers, at this temperature. On the 153rd day, the microorganisms, having penetrated the inside of the tissue, would saturate the client's circulation system and produce a progression of exceptionally undesirable side effects. Microbes would spread into the client's spinal string layer. So, all in all the person would become weakened and presently terminate. In this way, yes. All damnation breaks loose. They are then shown the root basement. Elsa specifies she is aware of the visitor's sensitivities, nut, shellfish, gluten responsiveness, and the menu has been arranged in like manner. They're then shown the bunkhouse where all of the staff resides, in cots like on a tactical dormitory. Elsa makes sense of that the staff resembles a family dealing with a typical mission to run the world's best cafe. They work 80 hours per week, beginning at 6 a.m. for five hours of prep work, collecting, gathering, maturing, butchering, butchering, hacking, marinating, soaking, smoking, treating, liquefying, spherifying, and so on. Then they have four hours for pre-administration prep. Dinner is four and a half hours long. Then the kitchen must be scoured for two hours. She is inquired as to whether she at any point gets worn out however she says, Gourmet expert holds himself to the most noteworthy conceivable norm and we have the pleasure of working at Hawthorne, as they go on across the yard to the eatery, Tyler gets some information about a cabin on a slope. Elsa says it's where the cook resides yet even the staff isn't permitted inside. The way to the eatery is opened, a huge square in the wall that opens ostensibly, and they all enter. There is a miserable elderly person drinking at a table toward the back 
N and Richard R as of now situated. There is an open kitchen behind every one of the tables where the staff is working diligently. Elsa lets them know all not to photo the dishes since culinary expert believes that piece of the excellence of his manifestations is unequivocally their transient nature. Tyler needs to see the kitchen and he takes Margot to converse with the top assistant chef who is making little gels. Tyler inquires as to whether he made it with a Paco jet and boasts pretty much the entirety of his foodie information. The top assistant chef realizes Tyler by name and expresses everybody on staff has a profound knowledge of the individuals who feast with them. He sits down and Margot calls attention to that, while the top assistant chef knows his name, Tyler never requested his. Everybody is given a little wine to begin. Cook Slowick, Ralph Fines, shows up in the kitchen. He's agonizing and extreme. He tastes the dish they're going to serve and supports. Every one of the servers then start to serve the entertained bouche, which we're told in a title card, as though on a menu, example, a pine nut toile cone loaded up with a shucks and strawberry sofrito and a goat's milk snow. Tyler snaps a picture and Margot brings up he shouldn't. The two of them attempt the food and Tyler violates it yet Margot isn't as intrigued by the experience. Margot peers out the glass wall that makes up the eatery to see the boat that brought them there cruising ceaselessly. Gourmet expert Slowick presents himself and tells the gathering throughout the following couple of hours, they will ingest fat, salt, sugar, protein, microbes, parasites, different plants and creatures, whole eco-frameworks, at an energetic however fair speed. He inquires as to whether they will help him out and not eat. Then proposes, all things considered, they taste. Enjoy, relish. The gathering is given the primary course, called the island. A title card peruses, first course, the island, rummaged plants, manila shellfish, seawater. The plate is comprised of different plants from the island put on rocks from the shore and canvassed in scarcely frozen seawater. Tyler calls attention to these are similar shellfishes they saw the person looking for prior and get stressed when culinary specialist hears him. The culinary expert says it is okay and that individuals on this island are not significant. The island and the supplements it gives exist in their absolute best state without being assembled, controlled, or processed. What occurs in that room is unimportant contrasted with what happens outside, in the dirt and the water and the air. Individuals are only a nanosecond yet nature is immortal, everlasting. Tyler starts crying, contacted at the dish being, wonderful. Margot is contemptuous and doesn't have any desire to eat any of it. She is promptly doubtful of the whole eatery. The remainder of the room revels in it, the food pundit Lillian Blossom breaks down the dish, I've tasted nothing so marine, Thalassa being the antiquated soul of the ocean in Greek folklore. Her significant other concurs that they're eating the sea. The celebrity needs direction from his aide on the best way to move toward the feast. The three tech brothers just noisily discuss tech and afterward condemn the plate, the plating's a little frou. I've had shellfish comparable at Kashiba. Be that as it may, whatever, presently we can say we've been here. We're purchasing an encounter, Elsa watches everything with disdain. Gourmet specialist gazes at Margot. Tyler notification and contemplates whether gourmet specialist is gazing at him. Margot turns and sees, looking him in the eyes. The culinary expert yells that they're plating in five and the whole kitchen yells back, indeed. Cook, as one, then, everybody is given bread administration. The culinary expert gives a discourse about how bread has existed for a considerable length of time and is typically normal among poor people. Today's flour and water and even, grain addresses 65% of all agribusiness while products of the soil are just 6%. He then, at that point, discusses how the gathering there isn't the everyday person so this evening they get no bread. Rather everybody is given shale plates with only the sauces. A title peruses, breadless bread plate, no bread, exquisite backups. Everybody is outraged by this. 
it accompanies a note making sense of that the bread they are not permitted to consume that evening is produced using a legacy wheat called Red Fife, created with an organization dedicated to protecting treasure grains. The celebrity attempts the creams. Lillian Blossom dismisses it as the gourmet specialist being very cognizant of food as a past filled with class while as yet protecting his feeling of the delightful. She grumbles that the emulsion on one of the sauces is broken. While her better half agrees. Lillian calls attention to that the culinary specialist meshes moral stories into his food and the game is attempting to get what the overall subject of the whole dinner will be, you can't actually tell until the last course. Tyler snaps one more photograph of the food. Margot doesn't have the foggiest idea why he's so into it. He makes sense of the amount he reveres food and that it's a craftsmanship that he appreciates. Back at Lillian's table, she continues endlessly about how she makes her own bread and, surprisingly, her own yeast. They are intruded on when Elsa brings a bigger compartment of the messed up emulsion that Lillian griped about, civility of culinary expert Slowick. Elsa is brought over by the Tech brothers. They whine that they see all the reasonable stuff however they would like some bread since Hawthorne is very well known for it. Elsa tells them, no. One of the Tech brothers is irritated and says, you know what our identity is, correct? Elsa says, yes. He reminds her. We work with Doug Verrick. She answers, no, you work for Mr. Verrick. The Tech brothers demand she brings them bread however she says no and they say, goodness, insulted. Elsa inclines in and murmurs to one, you will eat short of what you want and more than you merit. Margot sees Richard who is recognizable to her. And brings up to Richard that Margot seems to be their girl. The gourmet specialist comes over and asks Margot for what valid reason she isn't eating. She says, I surmise I would rather not top off ahead of schedule. The gourmet specialist says, that doesn't be sound imaginable, really. Forey exactly planned the bits to represent that. If it's not too much trouble, eat. The menu seems okay provided that you eat. Margot calls attention to he told them not to eat, when he said to. All things being equal, taste. He tells her that is not what he implied and she knows it. Margot tells him, thank you however I'll eat what I need to eat, when I need to eat. Given everybody treats the culinary specialist with regard, this is stunning yet the gourmet expert half grins and leaves, we see the elderly person once more, having no food at her table, she just has a glass of wine. The culinary expert applauds and they are informed they will have the following course, called, Memory. He educates the gathering a memory regarding growing up and focuses to the elderly person, letting them know it is his mom. She used to be very tanked when he got back home from school and at seven years of age, he showed up and his dad was much more alcoholic. His folks battled and his dad wrapped a phone string around his mother's neck. To inspire him to stop, the culinary expert as a youngster cut him in the thigh with kitchen scissors. He at absolutely no point ever addressed him in the future and consistently wishes he had cut him in the throat that night. The gathering is then given the primary course, memory, chicken thighs al minister, smoked pineapple salsa, tortillas. They're totally given a little chicken thighs with small scissors standing out of them, alongside plates designed with firmly looped phone strings and bowls of tortillas. The tortillas all have pictures on them. Lillian sees hers have cafes that were completely shut after she gave awful surveys. The Tech brothers sees record that uncover them for committing misrepresentation. They bring Elsa over and ask what they are. She answers, these are tortillas. Tortillas deliciosas. The Tech requests she makes sense of the pictures and she tells them, these are tortillas which contain charge records and different reports showing how the organization has stowed away exchanges with shell organizations, performed different demonstrations of scholarly burglary, and made apparently innumerable solicitations with counterfeit charges. She's asked the way that they got Stitch and Elsa says, please accept my apologies yet gourmet specialist never uncovers his recipes. The tech brother takes steps to close the eatery somewhere near morning and Elsa tells him, that won't be vital, 
the celebrity's tortillas are the banner of a silly film he did quite a while in the past basically for the cash, something like a terrible Adam Sandler satire. And sees photos of both of them like one with a wrap on Richard's head subsequent to having a melanoma taken out. In another, there is a photo of Richard with a youthful female escort out on the town, he persuades her it was photoshopped. At Tyler's table, the tortillas are pictures of him attempting to snap photographs of his feasts covertly prior that evening. He is concerned the cook is distraught at him and contemplates whether he ought to apologize. According to Margot, they're the ones who ought to apologize. We're sending it back. She attempts to wave over a server however Tyler speaks harshly to her, saying you don't send things back there, you say thanks to them for giving you access the entryway. He utilizes the tortilla to make a taco and raves about how incredible it is. Margot is irritated he snapped his fingers at her and gets up to leave. She heads to a corridor where an intricate silver entryway. Before she can enter, Elsa shows up and inquires as to whether she wants assistance. Margot says she's searching for the women's room and is pointed like that. Inside the women's room, Margot smokes a cigarette on top of a latrine, while peering out a section. A couple of holy messenger wings are being ready on the yard. The gourmet specialist enters the washroom and asks Margot what she's doing there. She says it's the women's room. He answers, I mean here on this island, you fool. You shouldn't be here. Margot was a somewhat late substitution and he is curious as to whether she's one of them or one of us. He leaves, befuddling Margot. At the point when she gets back to her table, Margot tells Tyler she needs to leave. He calls attention to they can't on the grounds that they're on an island and the boat is no more. The Tech brothers grumble about the tacos being comprised of records that would hold up in court. They examine having conceivable deniability and assuming they get turned in, they're turning in Verrick, as well, and he won't allow that to occur. For the fourth course, two servers unroll a canvas across the center of the floor. It's improved with bushels and covered with ocean fennel and eatable blossoms. Lillian Blossom and her better half wonder that it's like theater, in the Japanese mini Mursuto style. The cook goes to make sense of the following course and a tech brother requests to realize what is happening. Cook signals to Elsa and she punches the tech brother in the nose. The visitors are stunned. This is the main genuine viciousness they've experienced. The cook keeps, acquainting the staff with his top assistant chef, Jeremy, who made the following dish, the wreck. Jeremy stands ready next to him while the gourmet specialist makes sense of that Jeremy moved on from a culinary organization and composed a genuine letter that he needed to work at Hawthorne. That Jeremy is capable and generally excellent however he's not perfect and never will be. He frantic needs my work, my situation, my esteem, my status, my ability. Isn't excessively correct. Jeremy. Jeremy answers, indeed, culinary expert. Cook tells the gathering, Jeremy has neglected all that to attempt to accomplish that. He works 20 hours every day. He lacks the capacity to deal with companions or family. His whole life is administration and strain to place out the best food on the planet. Strain to satisfy his gourmet expert. Strain to satisfy the clients. Strain to satisfy the pundits. Also, in any event, when all goes right, and the food is great, and the clients are cheerful, and the pundits are as well, it is absolutely impossible to keep away from the wreck. The wreck you make of your life, of your body, of your well-being, of your mental stability, by giving all that you need to satisfying individuals you won't ever be aware, individuals whom you don't progressively care anything about. Jeremy, do you like your life, this life you imagined about? Jeremy answers, no, gourmet specialist. Culinary expert inquires, do you like my life, the existence you envy? Crying, Jeremy says, no, cook. Culinary specialist tells the gathering, fine people, your fourth course. Top assistant chef Jeremy's wreck. Gourmet specialist makes a stride back. 
Jeremy eliminates a gun from his belt and blows his head off. A superimposed title peruses, The Wreck, Strain Cooked Hamburger. Bone Stock, Treasure Carrots and Potatoes. R.I.P. Jeremy Laux, 1988-2020. Everybody starts shouting and overreacting. Richard gets up to leave and Elsa inquires as to whether anything is off base. Richard tells her he's leaving. According to Elsa, there is no boat to depart on. Richard tells her, then, at that point, I'll call a helicopter. Elsa says, that will be troublesome without telephone administration. Richard attempts to push past two servers holding meat knives. And instructs him to do everything that they say and Richard says to her. I'll deal with this. Elsa inquires, with which hand will you handle it? Your left or your right? Richard doesn't reply so she says she will pick and orders the servers to remove Richard's left ring finger. They do and Elsa advises the room assuming anybody attempts to leave, they will lose an extremity. The celebrity resents his right hand for bringing him there. Lillian Sprout is persuaded this is a trick for her advantage, which is the reason he messaged her and welcomed her by and by. Her significant other concurs its exhibition craftsmanship, both attempting to persuade themselves it's not actually working out. Elsa requests that Margot join the culinary expert in the kitchen. Tyler inquires as to whether he can come however is told no. In the kitchen, Cook tells Margot she's demolishing his menu and inquires as to why she's there. He tells her he can tell she's not one of them, she appears to have experience working retail. He inquires as to whether she is with us or them. She inquires, in the event that I respond to you, will I get to live? And the gourmet expert says, no, we as a whole will bite the dust this evening. Would you like to pass on with the individuals who give? Or on the other hand the individuals who take? He gives her a kitchen clock and says she has 15 minutes to decide. Dot. Margot returns to her table. Tyler is desirous she got a kitchen course. Gourmet expert returns and tells everybody, are there any inquiries regarding me, or Hawthorne, or why not a single one of us are leaving alive this evening? Tyler inquires, was that star Annis I recognized in the stew? Cher affirms it was. The famous actor inquires as to why this was occurring. The culinary expert expresses some of them were picked in light of what they've done or were smug observers. He brings up that Lillian Blossom's audits harmed many culinary specialists' occupations. A gigantic compartment of broken emulsion is then brought out for her. Margot inquires, for what reason do you have the right to pass on? The gourmet specialist answers, I have the right to bite the dust since I've squandered my life. I assumed I was a craftsman, however rather I see I've been carelessly attempting to if it's not too much trouble, individuals who can never be satisfied, bringing up his mom as the first of many he's attempted to please. He proceeds, presently, at the pinnacle of my powers, all I see is that my food goes in a flash to crap inside a rich man's stomach. He brings up that Richard and Anne have been there commonly. Richard gets it's been six or seven yet Cook Slowick brings up it's been multiple times while most see themselves as favored for getting to eat there once. He brings up they present each dish before it's introduced yet requests that they name anything they ate the last they were there. Richard can't think fo anything. And murmurs, cod, to him. The culinary specialist yells back, it wasn't cod, you fucking jackass. It was halibut. Uncommon fucking spotted halibut that we got only four hours before you showed up. He asks why they even irritation coming to the restow, the Tech brothers contribute that it's not his eatery, Doug Verrick is the proprietor. Culinary expert affirms that Doug Verrick possesses both the eatery and the island and hence, since the cafe is the gourmet specialist's whole life, Doug Verrick claims him. Be that as it may, this is convoluted as he as of now possesses Doug Verrick. Through the glass window watching out to the grass, a light is displayed on a man, Doug Verrick, wearing the heavenly messenger wings we saw before. His hands bound behind him, held up by a pulley rope over the ocean. Gourmet expert notices Doug had scrutinized his menu, 
requested replacements, and they utilized him to get the data imprinted on the tech young men's tortillas. Doug is gradually dropped into the ocean, left to suffocate, Margot's clock goes off. She's brought once more into culinary specialist's office and inquired as to whether she settled on her choice. She uncovers that she is an escort and since Tyler required a date. He employed her to go with him. She additionally takes note of that she realizes Richard given he once recruited her to take on the appearance of his girl while he jolted off and had her express things as though she was her. The cook figures she ought to be with the staff similar to individuals who have been oppressed, neglected, starved. The gathering is brought outside for their next course. The culinary expert acquaints them with his top assistant chef Catherine who will introduce the following dish. Catherine tells the group, quite a while back, gourmet expert Julian Slowick attempted to screw me. I declined his advances. Once more, after seven days he attempted. Once more, I declined. He didn't fire her however rather kept her in the kitchen and would not look at her without flinching or talk straightforwardly to her for a very long time. During which time male cooks transcended me in the positions. Catherine makes sense of she should have been dealt with not as an equivalent but rather as a prevalent and is superior to every one of the male top assistant chefs and even culinary expert Slowick. However, a lady gourmet expert doesn't challenge, she supports and consequently she's been grabbed, sneered at, procured less, all to embarrass her. So she will show them what genuine embarrassment resembles in the following course called, embarrassment. Catherine takes a little paring blade and cuts it into culinary expert Slowick's thigh. They then embrace. The blade pulled from his thigh. The gathering is informed that the men will be pursued and allowed a 45-second early advantage to stow away. Some take off running. Others trail behind. At 45 seconds, every one of the male servers run into the forest, attempting to track down them, the ladies are driven back inside the eatery as the pursuit goes on. And converses with Margot, who we presently know was employed for sex by Anne's better half. At the point when the men are found, they're beaten and afterward brought back inside. Tyler is the last man to be found, concealing in the smokehouse as opposed to going through the forest, and is given an additional dish as remuneration. The men return to the eatery and one of the tech young men is given a cake, his partners having said it was his birthday when they showed up. He extinguishes the candle. The culinary expert presently brings up, I'm apprehensive the menu this evening can't go on as arranged until we manage an unsettled matter. He tends to Tyler who has been sending him letters for quite a long time, communicating the amount he is a foodie and intrigued by Hawthorne. Tyler clarifies he's going after for eat in as a significant number of the world's best cafes as he can. The gourmet expert makes sense of why Tyler hasn't been stunned by that evening's occasions as he's been told ahead of time that everybody planned to bite the dust. He then brings up Tyler reference that he's an incredible cook at home and welcomes him to make the following feast. Tyler is brought into the kitchen to make his own dish, by and by on the clock. He carelessly hacks up leeks and shallots, which the culinary specialist Riley taunts, we should gain from Tyler a new dicing technique for which we have been tragically uninformed. Tyler requests margarine to sauté them and the gourmet expert derides, leeks and shallots sautéed in spread. I demonstrate the veracity of a transformation in cooking. Tyler demands sheep and afterward adds carrots, tricks, and different fixings into the dish. The cook derides him, inquiring as to whether he might want to place it into the pacojet, which he boasted about being no about prior. Tyler plates the dish. The gourmet expert attempts it and energetically claims to like it prior to bringing up how abominable it is. Tyler feels embarrassed. He is directed to the back, in Cook's office, to be managed. The culinary specialist lets them know they have one exquisite course left on the menu and should get ready for dessert. However, Elsa has been careless and neglected to dole out somebody to get a barrel that should be in the corner. He tells Margot she will go to the smokehouse to bring the barrel. Elsa proposes an individual from staff ought to go however culinary expert demands Margot go, 
to show them unequivocally which side she falls on. What's more, whether she needs to kick the bucket with them or us. Margot is given the way into the smokehouse. On out, she sees Tyler, hanging by a noose, dead in the culinary expert's office, Margot goes out in the grass and advances into the smokehouse. She rapidly finds the barrel yet first gets a scaling blade crazy. Through the window, she sees the gourmet expert's cabin, in the eatery, the famous actor inquires as to why he was picked given every one of the visitors are being rebuffed. The culinary specialist says he saw his film on his one vacation day, the one on the tortillas, and didn't appreciate it. His associate inquires as to why she is being rebuffed. He asked where she attended a university. According to she, Brown. He inquires as to whether she has understudy loans. According to she, no. Case shut. Margot enters the gourmet expert's bungalow to track down it's a reproduction of the cafe's kitchen. In this one, there is likewise a silver entryway. She crosses to it however it's locked. Elsa shows up in the house and tells her she should stress over the clients while the culinary specialist stresses over the menu, Margot is making her occupation troublesome. They have an immense fight around the cabin with Margot utilizing the blade she had ravaged. Toward the end, Elsa is cut to death. She attempts to clarify for Margot that she didn't fail to move the barrel, the culinary specialist never requested it. Margot takes the key off Elsa and goes into the silver space to track down a mystery room with piles of cookbooks and photographs of the culinary specialist all through his vocation, finishing on a paper image of him flipping burgers at a neighborhood cafe, apparently more joyful than he is presently. Margot sees a radio on the rack and calls out for the Coast Guard. When she returns into the house, the culinary specialist is there, inquiring as to whether she loves his home. Margot inquires as to whether he's exhausted taking care of his craft to rich individuals, for what reason doesn't he go work as a cook in a soup kitchen or a cloister? Culinary expert advises her to recover the barrel. Back in the cafe, Margot enters with the barrel. Gourmet specialist tells her the solution to her inquiry is he's a beast yet this evening all that he's done is 100% unadulterated. He tells her he has gourmet expert's hands and extinguishes a fire on her candle with his hand. He cites Martin Luther Ruler to say, we know through excruciating experience that opportunity is never deliberately given by the oppressor. It should be requested by the oppressed. A little boat shows up and the coast gatekeeper advances toward the eatery. The cook appreciates Margot for having viewed as the radio and orders the lounge area be cleared. The staff attempts to cover all that is gone on that evening and to clean everybody's countenances to disguise wounds. Culinary expert Slowick lets the gathering know that the man can't help them so there's no worth facing the challenge. It'll simply bring about the demise of a blameless man. The coast gatekeeper tells the cook he's heard there was an unsettling influence. The culinary expert denies this and no one in the room shouts out. The coast gatekeeper inquires as to whether anybody brought in a misery signal on the shortwave yet Margot doesn't shout out. He then perceives the celebrity and says he's a fan. The culinary specialist inquires as to whether he'd like his signature. The celebrity is given a pen and paper and he composes on it for the coast watchman. The official heads back, pointing his weapon at the culinary specialist. The room begins asking for help. The coast watchman focuses his weapon however at that point goes it to Margot, all the more explicitly, the candle on Margot's table which the gourmet specialist had put out. The firearm is really a lighter and he utilizes it to light the stifled flame. The culinary expert uncovers he's one of them and afterward tells Margot he's chosen she's presently an eater, a taker, a creature like the remainder, the gathering is presently informed they're getting their last course, chocolate is spilled out on the floor. Margot yells that she could do without the culinary expert's food. Also, she needs to send it back. The culinary specialist comes to her table and says. Please accept my apologies. What might be said about my food isn't as you would prefer. Margot says, you've removed the delight from eating. 
Each dish we've had this evening has been some intelligent activity as opposed to something you simply need to sit and appreciate. She calls attention to the food wasn't made with adoration. The cook is protective and says love is the main fixing in the entirety of his food. Margot lets him know the hot dishes were chilly, there's no character, just ideas. That as a cook, his one object is to serve individuals food they will like. What's more, he bombed her and exhausted her and he left her hungry. The gourmet specialist asks how hungry she is. What's more, she lets him know she's famished. He asks everything she needs and she says to him a cheeseburger, not an extravagant dismantled avant cheeseburger yet a conventional one. The gourmet expert says he'll make her one yet she thinks he's not proficient. The culinary expert vows to make the best cheeseburger she's at any point had. She asks how much and he says, $9.95. She inquires as to whether it accompanies fries and he inquires as to whether the fryer is still on. At the point when the top assistant chef affirms it is, he consents to fries. The culinary expert cooks in the kitchen. The following feast is recorded as cheeseburger, simply a very much made cheeseburger. It's introduced to Margot. She takes a nibble. She concurs it's perfect. However, makes sense of her appetite tends to take over and believes the rest should go. The culinary specialist sets up for her to get a to-go sack. He says thanks to Margot for D, in the cafe, everybody is given the bill before the treat is introduced. Everybody takes care of the bill as ordinarily, Lillian charging it to the magazine she composes for, Richard utilizing his Amex. The famous actor's colleague concedes she took cash from him and the two of them are remorseful towards one another. The culinary expert tells everybody they're on a no-tip framework so tip is incorporated. He lets them know their last treat course is a play on the customary pit fire exemplary, the S. Moore. He says it's the most exhausting of all sweets, modest chocolate, marshmallow, graham wafer however some way or another Americans like it since it's set ablaze. A coat made of marshmallows is put on every visitor. The floor is shrouded in chocolate sauce and graham saltine pieces and afterward the whole room is gotten on fire going. Outside Margot gets to the coast watchman's boat. She battles to inspire it to turn on however at long last does and can journey over the water back to the dock she boarded from hours sooner. Inside Hawthorne, everybody is ablaze and all the staff and visitors are kicking the bucket. A title peruses, last sweet course, s'more, marshmallow, chocolate, Graham Saltine, clients, staff, eatery, on the dock, Margot opens the, to-go, pack. She takes the cheeseburger and starts eating it. She comes to in and takes out an imitation of the menu they've had that evening, which we've found in titles all through the film. She utilizes it to wipe her face as the cafe detonates on fire, far away on the island.